Genesis chapter 30 and the verse 12. Just two verses here. It's regarding the birth of Asher, one of the twelve tribes of Israel, one of Jacob's sons. And verse 12 says, And Zilpah, Lee's maid, bear Jacob a second son. And Lee said, Happy, or Leah, whichever way you want to pronounce it, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. And if you have a marginal reference in the Bible, it will say happy. Happy. Turn to Genesis chapter 49, please. This is the great chapter where old Jacob is dying and he's blessing uh, his 12 sons. And you'll notice that in verse 3, he begins with Reuben, 49 of Genesis. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi. Verse 8, Judah. Verse 13, Zebulun. Verse 14, Issachar. Verse 16, Dan. Verse 19, Gad. And then he comes in here at verse 20 and speaks of Asher. Out of Asher his bread shall be fat and he shall yield royal dainties. Turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 33, and there we shall rest from the scriptures, at, the, at these scriptures for tonight. And we're back where we were last Lord's Day evening. And we're at Genesis chapter 13 and 33 and verse 13. And here it is Moses before he died is blessing the sons of Jacob. In verse 13, he comes in with Joseph. And of Joseph, he said, this is Moses now, blessed of the Lord be his land. Now I want you to notice the number of times precious is here for the precious things of heaven, for the dew and the deep that coucheth beneath. A lot of things couching beneath the surface in Israel, I can tell you. And for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things put forth by the moon. The moon does his work too, you know. And for the chief things of the, notice this phrase, of the ancient mountains. And for the precious things of the lasting hills. And for the precious things of the earth and fullness thereof. And for the good will of him that is the Lord God who dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and upon the top of the head of him that was separated. And you go down to verse 19, you have this tremendous verse, which I suggest to you tonight refers to the oil of the treasures that are underneath the surface in Israel. Then shall they shall call the people onto the mountain. There they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, now here's the phrase, for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of the treasures hid in the sand. And then down to verse 24, we have Asher again. And of Asher he said, let Asher be blessed with children. Let him be acceptable to his brethren and let him dip his foot in oil. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, 
and as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And we'll end our reading there. And we know that the Lord has promised to bless the public reading of his word. It takes 1,000 barrels of oil every second to run and service the 192 nations of the world. 1,000 barrels of oil every second. Many of the larger economies, the United States, China, and India, are using oil faster than they are finding it. In fact, the planet is producing people faster than they're finding oil. And scientists have recommended recently that the practice that the world should be practicing a rigid birth control policy to conserve the oil. And of course, they're thinking about abortion. We must stop the population for we have the oil to supply to them. The billions of dollars that America is given to the Muslim countries for oil in the Middle East is being used to buy military hardware in order to destroy them at a later date. You will notice if you study prophecy that the United States of America is nowhere to be mentioned when we come down to the final days, including the Battle of Armageddon. Every other nation that's involved in the scriptures that can be sought out by prophetic scholars can be accounted for. I wonder what has happened or what will happen to America. If Obama gets another three years, you'll see big changes. My opinion is, of course, and there are many opinions, but my opinion, of course, one of them is uh, maybe the lack of oil. It takes 21 billion barrels a day to run the United States of America. 800 of the world's greatest oil fields are about to shut down. And the ones that they are finding is not able to supply and it is of no quality compared to the first oil. I pointed out last week that Israel, 25 years ago, was importing 98% of its oil. Most of it was coming from Egypt and from Mexico, but in recent years, because of the hostilities and the hatred that's espoused towards the nation of Israel, that supply is being slowly cut off. Now, we saw last week that beside the green line, and the green line is uh, on the West Bank, it's the line between the Palestinians and the Jews. That disputed area, we saw that on the Israeli side of that green line, that mighty things are happening. A Russian Orthodox Jew, a geologist, Tovi Luskin, was reading Deuteronomy 33. These verses that we have read tonight, and he literally, literally went out on the strength of these verses into the territory of Joseph's ground, Ephraim and Manasseh is mentioned in the verses, sons of Joseph. And he began to drill according to the word of God. 
And he drilled. And he's still drilling. In that particular place, they have found 41 oil fields. And they cannot estimate the amount of oil that is there. Billions and billions of barrels of oil. The treasures beneath the sand and beneath the sea. Because out of the sea they're sucking gas and oil, the best quality ever to be found. Tovi Luskin has said recently, and I read what he said, he said that Israel will be able to supply the world eventually. Underneath the Dead Sea there are billions of barrels of oil and different sorts of material that the world is looking for. You see, in the end days, God says he'll put hooks into the jaws of the enemy to draw them towards Israel and the booty for what's going on. And they know what's been happening here is the drawn power to draw them in. This man, Luskin, has been called the father of Israel's energy industry. And while the rest of the world is losing oil, Israel's finding it. He's a modern Joseph. It is in the land of Joseph. And it was Joseph, what the Bible says, his roots went down deep and his bow went over, his bow went over the wall. And all the world came to him for bread. I suggest to you that this man is a modern Joseph. But not only have the hit as the headlines in the papers, papers in Israel recently called it the black gold, they have also went down at the foot of Mount Carmel, northwards between the mountains of Lebanon and the Mediterranean, where Asher's tribe settled. And they reckon that there, that there's billions and billions of oil. Well, God said that he would have oil under his feet. Didn't you read it? He'll dip his foot in oil. And in Asher's ground, they're finding the best quality of oil. This ground of Asher, the tribe of Asher, is, the, is described as the most fertile ground in Canaan. The Bible says his, his food shall be rich and his bread shall be fat and he shall yield royal dainties. Now we know from studying our scriptures that going along from that strip of land of Asher's territory are the plains of Megiddo. That great battleground where the battle of Armageddon is going to be fought soon. The place of the slaughter, the Bible calls it. Fourteen miles wide, twenty miles long. The Bible says that the kings of the earth are going to gather for the final battle of all times, and I'll preach on it some night. And they're gathering together, number one, to decimate the Jews, trying it once again. Hitler tried it, Haman tried it, Mussolini tried it. But not only to decimate the Jews for the booty, for the gas, for the oil, for the precious minerals that's under the foot and in the hills around the territory of Asher. By the way, the greatest of these great armies that are going to come they're going to come from the north and the south and the east and the west and they're going to gather 
The greatest of these army is the Chinese army. Two hundred million soldiers from the east will cross the river Euphrates. Isn't there a population of about 60 million in England? Two hundred million Chinese. And I read this just this week. Now listen to what I read. China's preparing for Armageddon. China's aircraft carriers, the multi-war warhead missile program have, has alarmed its neighbors and the United States. They have stockpiled bunkers in North China and have them stockpiled in a tunnel 3,000 miles long. That's from here to New York. What's that for? We're near the end. And there's no voice being lifted up. Where are the watchmen? We're near the end, sir. And Jesus is coming soon, and you're not saved yet. And well, you know it. While there's great prophetical truths associated with the tribe of Asher and around it, some of them were fulfilled long ago. And I'll give you one of them just for your interest. We read where Moses said that Asher shall yield royal dainties. One of the fulfillments of that came when Solomon, now listen to what I'm going to say, Solomon approached the king of Tyre, King Hiram, and that was in Asher's ground that King Hiram was. He approached him for the cedars of Lebanon to build the temple. I tell you, his ground had some mighty, mighty stockpile of wood. And we, we know from 1 Kings 9 that he floated it down the Mediterranean. And here's what it says. So Hiram gives Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. And also... Told in the, we're also told in the Song of Solomon that Solomon built a chariot of wood from Lebanon. That was from the bounty and the fatness and the fullness of the land of Asher. What did he do? He yielded royal dainties to the king. He gave unto the king a portion of the fullness and the blessings that he had. Let me ask you now tonight, listen believer, have you given unto the king? What his rightful deserves are. Have you yielded on to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, something out of the fullness of your blessing? Hmm? Because Asher yielded the royal dainties, and God blessed him, and he gave on to the king. How's your tithing going, I wonder? Hmm? Is he getting the tenth? I'm not asking for it, I don't want it. Is God getting the tenth? And is he getting <coughs> is he getting everything that he should get? Because mainly he has blessed you. Do you ever stop to think of the blessings of God? Well, you'd need to start yielding some of them royal dainties unto him. Or is a judgment seat coming? When they will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. But not only is there prophetical teaching here, there's evangelical teaching here. We read that whenever Asher was born, his mother Lee called him happy. 
Happy am I, for the daughter shall call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. Now we know that the word blessed and the word happy in many places in the scriptures are the same words. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus Christ gathered the disciples around him on the Mount of Olives in Matthew chapter 5, which we call the Beatitudes? There's about ten of them, one after the other. Blessed, 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 blessed. In the second one, he says this, Blessed or happy are those that mourn. Now let me come in quickly here with this, because that has got nothing whatsoever to do with mourning at a funeral. And I wish that these ministers at funerals would learn that when they're coating it round grave sides. There's nothing happy about standing round the graveside of a loved one. There's nothing blessed looking down and seeing the wee one being covered with Mother Earth. But Jesus says, blessed and happy are they that mourn. You read it in the context and read the first one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Do you know what he's saying here? Blessed and happy are those that mourn and those that are sorrowful and those that grieve over their sin. Oh, that's a different thing now. Tell me, have you ever grieved over your sin? Does your sin annoy you, sir, tonight? Does it annoy you enough to send you to your knees and start weeping? Does your sin, believer, not concern you? Hmm? You just go on and on and on. Does it not concern you? Have you no conviction? Have you no repentance? It's not a bit of wonder some of you are not happy. Not a bit. Oh no, blessed or happy. Listen to what Psalm 32 says. Blessed, blessed or happy is the man whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sins are covered. Hallelujah. I tell you, there's nothing makes me more blessed or more happy than to know that my sins are cast in the sea of God's forgetfulness, never to be remembered again, no more, forever. And I mightn't look too happy at time, but I tell you, I'm happy when I think of that. There was a day that I mourned over them old sins, you know. I did indeed. I spent a sleepless night. Cried to God, do you know anything about it? Hmm? No, no, sinner tonight, do you know anything about it? Do they hurt you? Do they annoy you? Do they vex you? And you keep on doing them, and doing them, and you don't want to do it. But I tell you, if you want happiness and if you want release and you want blessing, you'll have to confess and forsake and turn and flee from them and get before the Lord and stay before him until you do. Now you have your Bible open at 33, so just look at verse 29. We'll not be turning from this chapter tonight. Look at what verse 29 says. Happy, blessed art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord. I'll tell you, that's salvation. That's the happy man. That's the blessed man. Ah, but go up to verse 27. 
Now watch this verse very carefully. Because here we not only have salvation, we have protection. The eternal God is thy refuge. Now notice the phrase, the eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. That's eternity again. Listen, my friend, do you think that he'll drop you out of his arms? Do you think he'll let you fall? This is everlasting salvation. This is eternal salvation. It is the eternal God that has wrought it. I'm not saved one day and lost another day. I am in the eternal everlasting arms of God that can never fail. And he'll never let me fall. There's salvation here and there's protection here. And at the end of verse 70, 27, there's destruction. And out of thee shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. I tell you, he can give you a complete victory over sin tonight. He didn't die for anything less. You have no need to be under the bondage of sin tonight. And he gave not only salvation and protection and destruction in verse 28, jubilation, because it speaks here of the corn and the wine, and they speak of joy. That's a happy man. That's a blessed man, the one that saved. Oh, that was salvation that has protection, that has this. Uh, power to destroy over every sin and the rejoicing and praising him. My friend, that's the way you need to be in these dark days for Jesus is coming. Some of these days he's going to descend the slopes of the sky. There's not one prophetic scripture to be fulfilled until Jesus comes to rapture the church and take them out. Not one. What we're dealing with in all these prophetic scriptures are to do with his coming to the earth, not to the air. And if you're not clear on that, I'll put you clear on it before these meetings are over. He's about to burst the clouds. Behold, I come quickly. You need to get ready. So there's prophetical teaching here, there's evangelical preaching here, ah, but there's practical preaching here, because listen, don't turn to this. It says in Psalm 41 and verse 1, and we're still thinking of Asher now, this was his name, Blessed or happy is he, is he that considereth the poor. And there's a happy man. That's a blessed man. Do you consider the poor? Hmm? Did you knock anybody's doors of anybody's door at Christmas that's getting it hard? Big family and no job? Hmm? Do you ever think of the one parent family not far away from you struggling? Do you care about Do we? Do I? Oh, but there's no poor people now. Is there not? Some sitting beside you in the meeting. Blessed or happy is he that considers the poor. So there's a very definitely practical touch here. Ah, but there's a national touch here. And I'm going to hit this now. Because we're told in the Word of God, Blessed be the nation whose God is the Lord.
That's why England is in the state of confusion that she is in tonight. And that's why the Sodomites are ruling the land and the Islamists are ruling the land. I tell you, it's not God that is the Lord. It is the, it is, it is, it is the Islamists. It is the Muslims. They have forsaken the God of their fathers and the God of heaven, saying the God of their fathers, the God who blessed them down through the centuries and made them what they were. I'm talking about England. That's why they're not a happy nation tonight. That's why they're not a blessed nation tonight. I I don't know what all this fuss about the flag is. I'm on very dangerous ground when you're talking about flags. I know that. I know it. But it seems to me that everything is gone but the flag. No, the nation has forgotten God. And my friend, listen, what good will a flag be to you when you can't get oil? And don't you think that oil prices are going to come down? They're going to get dear. And when you drive past the filling station, you'll hardly drive past one, but you'll see some boy with a barrel or a tank or a drum or something bringing a drop of oil to top her up or to put it in to keep them warm for the week. Sure, in the 1920s in Germany, they drove the Mercedes into the, into the potato field to the farmers and got a couple of bags of potatoes and left the old Mercedes. She was no good for there was no oil for her. It's not flags we need to get our eyes on, it's God. It's not protesting that we should be at his plane. Oh, I tell you, is it any wonder the nation's in confusion? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And I'll be dealing with the Sodomites another night too. There has to be a voice, my friend, lifted. And, and the veil must be taken off. We are so near the end. When you see the state of the so-called, and I can't even, you can't call it the Church of England, and all this going on, and the wickedness and the evil, and the blindness and the deception. So we have touched on the prophetical, we have touched on the evangelical, we have touched on the practical, we have touched on the national. And I want to close with touching on the devotional. And we're back at the 24th verse of Deuteronomy 33. Now read this. And of Asher he said, lest Asher be blessed with children. That was blessings around him. Let him be his acceptable to his brethren. That was blessings upon him. He must have been easy to get on with. There's a lot of God's people and you couldn't get on with them. But the word of God says that he was acceptable to his brethren. He had blessings around him, the children. And children are a blessing, you know. And I hope you appreciate that. And they're a very precious blessing too. And you have the responsibility 
of bringing them up and teaching them the word. And God give them to you for that, for you to do that. And if you miss that, you'll pay a price for it. Well, no, I can tell you, I tell you, man, I, I know men who tell me I paid a big price because I didn't give the time to my children that I should have given to them. I was too busy making money. I was too busy working. I was too busy traveling. And I've lost them. Did you have? And it's not over for you yet, but you're going to have to give an account for them. No, he says, Asher had blessings around him. And he had blessings upon him. And he had blessings under him because let him dip his foot in oil. But here's the bit I want to finish with tonight. He had blessings before him. Verse 25. Thy shoes shall be iron and brass, and as thy days, and there's an S on that now, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. Now notice what's in that verse. Thy shoes, thy days, and thy strength. I want to encourage you now. I want to comfort you now. There's a lot of God's people and they need comforted. There's a lot of God's people and they need a good bit of devotional teaching. It's not easy out there, sure it's not. I'm not out there. I'm in here. <laughs> I had my day out there. You have to rise in the morning. I know you have. If you have a job, you have to go to it. And you have family to contend with. And you have finances to contend with. And you have health to contend with. And it's not getting easier, any easier. In fact, it's getting worse. If only the authorities would disclose, I believe it would be good because it would, it would stir us up. If only they would disclose the amount of suicide there has been in the month of December. You know that there were six in Fermanagh alone within a week and we never heard a word about it. A lot of hurting people out there. There's a lot of things hit us in life, isn't there? But here's this text says, As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Thy shoes, thy days, thy strength. Now when we come to the shoes we have to go immediately in mind to Ephesians chapter 6 because it tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that's the portion about the armour of God. You know I know a, a believer in Fermanagh and every morning he rises at 6 I think it's after 6 o'clock and he, 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 he literally puts not literally but he he, 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 he vocally puts on the whole armour of God. And he starts with the shoes. Because that's where the Bible starts with. And he says, Lord, I'm putting on the shoes of the gospel of peace. I'm putting on the helmet of salvation. I'm putting on the girdle of truth. You need the helmet of salvation on you. You need the helmet to cover the mind.
We need our minds kept as well as our hearts, Paul tells us. The devil's, the devil's attacking the mind. He attacks the mind and it's getting worse and worse as we near the Lord's return. The demonic powers are fierce. Just when he came the first time, all hell broke loose. The demon possessed people everywhere. And as he, as he comes the second time, it's going to be the same. And it is the same. We haven't got the power in the church to bind the powers of hell and darkness that's destroying our youth. The, the, the demons of suicide, the demons of sodomy, the demons of adultery. We need our minds kept. And he puts on the whole armor of God vocally before he goes out into his business. And so we're told here about the shoes. Well, do you know, let me give you this in closing tonight. Do you know that the shoes of the Roman soldier, you know when Paul wrote Ephesians 6 on the armor of God, they reckon that he, well, we know he was in prison, but they reckon that he was chained to a dead Roman soldier. He wasn't in a prison like we are prisons. He was in a hole in the ground, an old rat-infested pit. That's where they took him out from, and that's where they walked him to Rome, down the streets of Rome to. That's where they walked him before Nero's men, and they took the head off him. For the sake of the gospel, and for the sake of Christ, and for the sake of us, the sea was chained to a dead Roman soldier. And, and he's guarded by maybe two other soldiers. And he looks at the armor and he goes through it. And he leaves us that mighty, those mighty things in Ephesians 6. But the only armor that he speaks, part of the armor that he speaks more than once about is the shoes. Three times he tells us to stand, stand, withstand the fiery darts of the wicked one. You see, they had the breastplate of righteousness and when the enemy used to come with the fiery darts, light them like the petrol bombs, only with a dart on the end of them and they'd fire them at the soldiers and the breastplate would catch them. And he's spiritualizing it. He says the fiery darts of the wicked one will come. But why he leaves the emphasis on the shoes is this. Because if the shoes don't work, nothing works. The shoes of the Roman soldiers were studded. And they had to dig them in and stand their ground. Because if they went down, there was no use in the shield or the breastplate. So that's why he lays emphasis upon the shoes. Stand. Listen, we need to stand in these last days. Thy shoes shall be as brass. Oh, stand, you young people, for Christ. Stand for him in your workplace. Stand for him in the school. Stand for him in the university. Don't be ashamed of him. He died for you. He hung naked on a cross for you. He was battered, brutalized, murdered, if you want to call it. Savages of men spat upon him, nailed him to that old cross. He wasn't ashamed of you, and he wasn't ashamed of me. Thy shoes speak about the feet, thy days speak about the future. And I don't know, and you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You don't. And it's a good job. It's a good job. But if the Lord tarries, it'll come. And God only knows what it will bring. Some in our fellowship, and they've got very bad news in the last few days. As I did, I don't know. 
I don't know what this week will bring. I don't know we'll be back here next week. But here's what he says. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. Thy shoes, the feet, thy days, the future, thy strength, the faith. So shall thy strength be. And he's not just talking about physical strength. You know, there's old souls in beds tonight, old believers in bed tonight, and in nursing homes tonight, and they have no strength. No strength. They will lift their hands. But I tell you that the God of Israel, and the God of Jacob, watches upon them, looks upon them, and whispers in their ear, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. I tell you, he can give spiritual strength. There's those in this meeting tonight and you lost loved ones, not very long ago. Do you know the only reason that you can go on the way you're going is He's strengthening you. He gives you enough strength for the day. No, He'll not give you the grace or the strength for next week. He'll give it to you for that exam. Some of you young people are doing exams this week. And God bless you, I'll be praying for you. And for that hospital appointment. And for that ugly situation that you have to deal with. And for that fellow that's about to leave home. And that young lassie that's breaking your heart. He'll give you strength. He'll give you strength for the day. And you just wait for him now. Just take your time. I tell you, he can pour in the grace and the strength when you need it. Will you let him do that? Will you sit still? Will you trust him? Have faith in God.